Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. I've styled myself as someone who would rather seek out into the unknown than get comfortable. As a result, I'm continuously looking out for works that I haven't found yet. Typically, I don't really have a clue of what I'm looking for, I just go in blind. Think of it like going into a bookstore just looking for something to catch your eye, even if you don't know what it is. It was in the pursuit of this that I discovered fantasy writer Tom Van Hooser's RPG works, Laughing Moon Chronicles, and its successor, Wheelhouse. For the purposes of brevity, I will call this the Laughing Moon Duology. Much like my previous retrospective, I'll be covering both games in this little micro-series. We'll start with Laughing Moon Chronicles, the game about controlling one's fate. Does it strike out on its own, or is it the shadow of its inspirations? Let's find out. At 182 pages, Laughing Moon Chronicles has a respectable presentation. It could be argued that it's a little too in love with the ancient tome look, but that was a thing at the time. I'll also give credit to the artist. Not only is there a lot of good art, but it's fairly consistent and adds to the game's voice. I do have a bit of an issue with the PDF lacking bookmarks, and it's not the only offender of this kind of thing, but I've got to call it where I see it. While it's tempting to delve into magic, I find that an easy measure of a fantasy game is how it handles non-mages. To that end, we'll be building a classic sword for hire in Joran Ryua. The first step is general info. We've already established the concept at the outset, so the only part to note here is choosing a race and occupation. The most fitting pick for him is Half-Elf, so we'll go with that. This grants Joan the Half-Elf's base attributes, each capped at 20. This is in addition to the starting spread of skills. His occupation of choice is Mercenary, which has a suggested list of skills, and we'll be delving into that next. Second is skill sets, where we have a certain amount of points for attributes and skills. For personal attributes, we have 10 points. Distributing them results in the following spread. Brawn 10, Constitution 10, Intelligence 5, Fortitude 8, Agility 8, Dexterity 6, and Perception 7. For general adventuring skills, we have 25 points to spend. I'll take into account the racial bases. Joran's skill set here is Physical Endurance 35, Tracking 50, Field Bandaging 40, and Intimidate 25. For Arcane skills, we have 20 points to spend, which will go on Fey Lore at 25 and Potion Making at 5. The last set covers Faith, Luck, and Bandu, of which we have 15 points to spend. This will be primarily put into Luck of the Dice, raising it to 25%. Lastly, Combat skills, of which we have 40 points to spend. We'll start by putting 10 of these in Combat Readiness, bringing it to 2d10. The remaining skills are Parry 4, Sword 4, Staff 2, and Mighty Blow 4. The last piece of the equation is armor and weapons, in which we gain one weapon for each skill category and armor, with an additional piece if so desired. Given his skills and his basic setup, he starts with a bastard sword, a bladed staff, and armor-wise goes with banded mail and a helm, making his total defense 18. In a weird way, character creation here reminds me of the skill system in Anima. And if I have a major issue with it, it's the lack of a summary page here. And the fact that the point skill conversion is so varied makes things a little more crunchy than it needs to be. Most of this could be streamed on a little with a chart of these skills and what they do. Also, I question the point of the occupations section, given it's merely a set of suggested skills. This character creation isn't bad per se, but it's very, very roundabout. Dice rolling is a case of high-low, as if the game is something of a kit bash. Attribute checks are resolved as a roll under d20, while the skills appear to be based on percentile rolls. What does bug me in this is the divorcing of attributes from skills. It almost discourages skill variety given the whiff factor that d100 can have. I could understand starting out at low power, but it feels like there's little interplay between attributes and skills. I do like the spread of different skill categories, making non-magical ones still able to use some arcane skills, though. Bandu, the ability to bend fate, can be considered the closest thing to an extra effort resource in this game. The effects it grants are based on the points spent. One grants a reroll, or it forces the GM to do a reroll. Two points grants a free action, and three points grants a plus five to a d20 roll, or a plus 25 to a skill check. Four points recovers stamina, and five points can be used to grant an auto hit, activate an enchanted weapon, or go first on initiative. Combat seems to have an attempt at economy of action, where the combat readiness skill determines how many action you have. Depending on that skill, you roll a die ranging from 1d10 to 2d12. Every multiple of five gets you one action to use. 
Combat-wise, attacks are the standard d20 versus defense. Every 5 damage results in a wound to a certain body part, and a loss of 1d6 stamina. I see the attempt here, but 11 hit locations and a stamina track is frankly excessive. But that ties into something I'll get into at the conclusion. Arcane magic is rooted in several skills. Caster's control, read magic, and spell casting. Control determines the die you may roll for attempts on casting a spell with a target number that varies based on level and circumstance, the maximum die result having an explosion effect. If you roll snake eyes, however, you've botched the spell and have to roll a d10 on the botched table. In any case, casting a spell costs its level and spell points. You can push it without spell points, but every point beyond zero inflicts 1d4 stamina loss. Lastly, there's the powerful and dangerous Kulothian magic. Doing so consumes twice the spell points it normally would, but is cast at twice the caster's level and lowers the target's resistance by 10. Furthermore, there is a 30% chance of adding in some chaotic effect, akin to wild magic. On paper, all this seems sound, but I don't care for the spread of required skills. Spellcasting requires a rating of 15 in read magic at minimum, and a rank in spellcasting costs 5 more. That's quite a big chunk out of the starting points. This also ties into the die rolling issue, and once again, the devil is in the details. Despite it not being the case, if you had told me this game was made in 1996, I wouldn't have batted an eye. I've talked about how since 2000 there's been a trend of unification, the idea of a core mechanic that is the root where everything springs from. Laughing Moon doesn't really have this. High d20 on combat, low d20 on attributes, percentile rolls on skills, rolling high on skill effects. This is effectively taking five steps from a three-step job. More so, the inconsistency of the skills demands a chart that there isn't since skills are by no means one-to-one. -one. I suspect that a lot of this could be made easier with the degree of proper archetypes or a more forgiving route of skill allocation. In any case, this feels more like a collection of ideas than a unified game. To that end, I can only give the game a rating of caution. There are some good ideas here, but it would need some unification to be more than anything else. Inevitably, this game's approach would hit a brick wall idea-wise. The solution to overcoming this wall was blowing the world up and starting fresh with a bit of a post-apocalyptic bent. But we'll get into that one next time.